class. It only takes about four hours to read Genesis. We only have about 40 minutes in class time, now about 35. But we can study it over a lifetime. Hope you have your books, hope you have your outlines, and I will be going over a lot, but the greatest blessing will come to you as you read each book. And I'm going to truly push studying each time. You might remember this from four and a half years ago, this introduction. I've always been intrigued with how things are made. I've always been intrigued with how things are made. And there's a TV show called How It's Made. It spotlights various products. Here is one. It spotlights uh, a, a beautiful design of a sophisticated piece of machinery that makes seat tracking for automobiles. With a push of one button, this machine makes and impressively finalizes uh, within 10 seconds, that particular product holding you secure in your car seat. Well, question, is this sophisticated piece of machinery a product of design? Or did the loose wires and metal rods and screws eventually fall into place to produce that? Or what about the computer, the amazing invention that makes everything easier, for better or worse sometimes, but can imagine doing certain things without it? Should we admire the intelligence behind its design, or do we consider ourselves very lucky that just all the elements in nature gradually resulted in this form? Or what about this beautiful building? A product of architectural genius, or did the glass, steel, rock, and concrete just kind of happen to fall up into place, maybe as the wind blew? That, all of these are physical effects from human beings who had a mind to design, humans that simply fashioned, made something with the elements that were already there. But in each of these three scenes, you can draw the conclusion that what you saw was there not by accident, not by chance, but by design. Is it any less likely to conclude that everything you see here is not the product of accident, but by design? Now, granted, this would take us into a lot of different directions, and this is not, as much as I love Christian apologetics, this is not a study on condensing all the evidence for God and the creation of the world. I love that. But this lesson is to simply, like the Bible does, begin with the assumption that any mind can see that they are here because of something, and we need to know what that something is. The Bible begins with the premise that we are all here because of God who happens to be a moral God, a holy God. And thus, because of our sin, our relationship with Him is in jeopardy of being eternally severed. And the most important thing to God and the most important thing to us is revealed by how the, God, the Bible begins. It begins by telling us the story of how God has worked to bring about our redemption. And that's what God's entire book is about to us. The Bible's opening statement in Genesis 1-1 is arguably the greatest understatement and the greatest summary of all time. In the beginning, God created. Wow, what a great opener. And all of creation shows His glory. Let's not confuse the issue. The question is not where did anything come from. The matter to, to address is where did it all come from? The vastness of it all. The universe is a big effect because of a big spiritual God who is outside the laws that he created, yes, for us, but are natural to point back to him. Those who only study it from a physical standpoint will say that the laws of nature break down the further back you go. And you can call something nothing, or you can call nothing something, but when you go back to it, the only way that makes sense is that a God, identified by His creation, but separate and apart from it, above it, touched our so-called flatland, if you remember that illustration, touched our three-dimensional world, and in violation of our laws of matter, matter, created everything out of nothing, something that only God could do, the best answer to what we have. Uh, and observe. Psalm 95, Psalm 95, 1 through 6, we sing this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and in his mountain peaks belong to him. Uh, the sea is his, he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship and kneel before the Lord our Maker. I love love that psalm and the reverence and the power that it shows and the wonder that it shows, but also it implies a close relationship with God, the one who created all this. I can't imagine living my life without knowing the one who created all this and me. And millions of people are living their lives not knowing this God. 
But the psalmists do, and I hope that we do, and I hope we learn him even more. Psalm 19, 1 through 4, tells us something very interesting. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim, that is, they're telling us what they know, the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Have you ever done a wait what, you know, uh, experience with those scriptures? You think, wait, what did that just say? What did that just say? What is creation, all of creation, telling us? It's telling us something about God. It's telling us that the creation is evidence that our God is awesome, our God is wise, our God is powerful, and His letter to us tells us that He wants a relationship with us. God says, I want you to know me, because He sure knows us. So God, not only did He create a little thing called a, a universe, but within that universe He also created you. He created you to know you and to know life through His Word. So we will have a survey of Genesis, just a survey because there's so much here. We're only covering about a thousand years of history and a four-hour text of inspired literature, so there's much that will, you, that will come to you only if you do the follow-up study from these outlines. Um, and there's no way to do it justice otherwise. These handouts that you have, you'll benefit most from the readings. Last week we suggested for you to read at least either the major assignment, which is everything, or the minor assignment, those key chapters, 1 through 3, 6, 7, uh, 6 11, 12, 15, 28, and 39. Those are key chapters. It's always hard to pick. But if you have, you get the greater blessing for coming into this class tonight. If you haven't, you can always pick up right there. Like in Sunday school, <laughs> the best answer is always Jesus. And it's always Jesus. Here is a Bible chart spanning over 1,600 years of time across three continents, over 40 different authors in three different languages, yet it has one central message, God and salvation, the glory of God and salvation to everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. That is beautiful. And we also have this list of Old Testament uh, emphasis. As we go through each book, we will see how Jesus is portrayed, and we learn how it's been pointing to Him all along. Genesis, the first five books, actually, the Pentateuch, Genesis, He is the promised seed. We'll talk about that tonight briefly. The promised seed, who will, in the next four books, be the, prom uh, the Passover lamb to atone, the scapegoat to remove our sin, the brazen serpent to give us healing, and the lawgiver so that we have righteousness to live by. It's beautiful. But as we look at this on the screen, we see all the books of the Bible in category, or should I say the Old Testament. And it's going to be interesting to see as we get to the history books how all of these other books are kind of woven like cards. Things are happening at the same time. But those first five books here, Genesis through Deuteronomy, those set the tone for everything. From that point forward, we have the history of God's chosen people and what they wrote and the messages that God revealed to people so that they would know in anticipation of the coming Messiah. I mentioned this earlier, how the Genesis shows Jesus as the promised seed, and that will be our focus tonight. Since we are just getting started here, I do like the idea of giving us a framework, so I'm going to click a button and hope to soon hear the audio that's embedded within this video. I could show you my slides, but I would rather you just enjoy a professional, quickly spoken video of the entire Bible in three minutes. This will help you tremendously and realize Genesis covers about all of what you'll see uh, across the top line. Here we go. Welcome to Three Minute Bible Study on Biblical History. In the beginning, Can God created okay? the heavens and the earth, and God created man and woman. Creation was good. Then Adam and Eve rebelled and fell from God. We Wickedness and priest and judgment came in the flood on all but Noah and those in the ark. Noah's descendants were dispersed at the Tower of Babel, and God chose Abram and his seed to receive the promised land, to become a nation, and to bless all nations. The promise continued through Abraham's son Isaac and his son Jacob, also known as Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, one of which would rise to the right hand of power in Egypt. The Israelites came down to live in Egypt, but later became enslaved for about 400 years. Through Moses, God delivered them and made a covenant with them at Sinai, where they received the law and instructions for the tabernacle. But being unfaithful, they were detained in the wilderness for 40 years, and the next generation took the promised land under Joshua. Judges then led the people until Samuel's day, when Saul was appointed the first king of Israel. After Saul's rejection, God chose David to be king and promised that his seed would be a son to God would build a house to God, and his kingdom would be established forever. David's immediate son Solomon did build the temple, but the promise of a kingdom forever would be part of the messianic hope in Israel. 
After Solomon's death, the nation divided into northern and southern kingdoms, both largely unfaithful and ignoring the prophets calling for repentance. As prophesied, both nations fell, Israel to Assyria in 722 BC and Judah to Babylon, along with the destruction of the temple in 586. After the Babylonian captivity, many returned to the land with Zerubbabel and Ezra and rebuilt the temple, followed by Nehemiah, who rebuilt the city walls. 400 years passed, and Israel looks for the promised Messiah to come. The New Testament brings us to the first century with John the Baptist announcing that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Four Gospels record the teachings of Jesus, his work with the apostles, and the miracles that identify Jesus as the Messiah, or Christ. At the end of his life, he establishes the Lord's Supper, surrenders to his enemies, and his disciples flee. In fulfillment of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, he is tortured, crucified, and buried. But on the third day, the tomb is found empty, and he appears to the apostles. He tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit, and he ascends to the Father. Acts 2 records the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit falls on them, and Peter preaches Jesus as the risen Christ. 3,000 Jews are baptized that day in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. The church grows quickly but soon faces intense persecution from opponents like Saul, later known as Paul. But after an encounter with Jesus, Paul himself is converted and begins preaching Christ, helping spread the gospel far beyond Israel. The letters of Paul, along with texts from James, Peter, John, etc., round out the rest of the New Testament. That's your three-minute overview of Old Testament and New Testament history. All right. I love that video so much, you may see it periodically, and now you know the whole Bible. But as we focus on Genesis, let's again realize we're dealing from creation to the flood, and then all of that comprises the patriarchal period up to the point of Joseph, and then of course uh, Moses, and we're not quite to Exodus yet, but that will be next week. Um, God is eager to tell us what He wants us to know. So on your outline, here's how it looks. The book of Genesis is an epic, a drama on a grand scale. We see the good, uh, God's good creation progressively soured, uh, I want a stronger word now for that, but as a result of, a, of humankind's sin. However, we also see how God's eternal plan to save and restore fallen humankind begins to unfold. And this is what it's all about. The, uh, the name of the book itself comes from the first four words translated from, of uh, course, into English, in the beginning. And we'll talk about the word in Hebrew and then the translation of that into Greek in the Septuagint. Genesis basically means origin or beginning. Origin or beginning. Bereshith bara, Elohim, God created out of nothing, what we see. And the author is Moses. It's good to know that the Pentateuch is written by Moses so that as we're going through the events, we will see and appreciate that Moses eventually was inspired to write and record all that has taken place. In a related work here, I'd like to read a little bit for you on the screen. And this is just a, a little bit. The title term Genesis comes from the Hebrew word Bereshith, uh, the first word in the Bible, in Hebrew, of course, and it means in the beginning. It, later, it was translated into Greek for the uh, Greek thinking minds around the just before New Testament times, and it means origin or beginning. And everyone knows that Moses wrote this, at least those who believe and are not skeptical towards about everything in life. But if we think that Jesus is credible, then we have to acknowledge that Jesus himself acknowledged these things. And so uh, we give credit to where it is due. Another idea is that the time frame was interesting. Um, most logical time seems to be when Moses was with God on Mount Sinai. Very interesting idea. And that the beginning of Genesis cannot be dated with certainty, but the final events of the book probably occurred around 1700 B.C., half of the entire period of the Old Testament history. You're dealing with a chunk of time. It is absolutely incredible. As we continue... The account of his death was added later, most likely. The purpose and main message of the book, Genesis relates the origin of the universe. And here is the godless view. The godless view says, In the beginning was matter which beget the amoeba, which beget the worm, the fish, the amphibian, the reptile, the lower mammal, the lemur, the monkey, and then man who imagined God. Now your kids and grandkids have been taught that probably long before you know, but I prefer the superior view, the one that's most logical. In the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth. And both of these views are put into the chart like this. Either we had a beginning or we had no beginning. This isn't all science, but I want to tell you this. Used to be, atheists would tell you we had no beginning. Then they learned a lot about science, didn't they? And they say, well, we can't argue that we did have a beginning, so oh, was the beginning caused or was it not caused? And they realized it was caused. Well, what was the cause? Nothing or God? And if you followed this in its logic form, not scientifically, but also morally, ethically, you realize the nature of who we are in objective truth. You have two different categories, two different ways of thinking. And the atheist would have to tell you the answers to life's most important questions they can't really answer. Where do we come from? Who are we? Why are we here? How should we live? Where are we going? They would say accident, 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 whatever you want to do, because we're going nowhere. On the surface, that sounds very tempting, doesn't it? Because you can do whatever you want. God's given us that choice. But we have to be real and honest with all evidence for study and reach the conclusion that we are here because of God who is moral and has a will for us to live by and is glorified when we choose righteousness, objective righteousness over sin. And you have two options, two different worldviews. And I choose the Bible. So as we continue, the origin of mankind and the origin of marriage and the home. I won't be aloof to the news of the day, but I will say that very few people will say what they do on earth to God on that day. Um, as society gets farther from God, it will be harder to hide your Christianity, and it should not hide, of course, anyway. If God, if the God of Scripture created me, then there is a pattern and purpose for my life. And going all the way down here, we're looking at the origin of God's promise uh, to redeem us from the sin that came into this world. Genesis sets the stage for the great story of redemption. And this is best to see, scene by scene, the whole saga of salvation as we go through the book. And I want to encourage you again as you're looking at the outline. The best way to work with this handout and what you have is to toggle between the two. Read the outline and then go to your scripture and read the verses that are referenced in your outline. It helps you stay focused scene by scene and to know how to input all that information as we go through the incredible journey of, of, of sin, enter the world, and how God feels towards sin. You see the flood. And then 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 lets us know that uh, those in the ark were saved by the waters of the flood. And I remember asking in a sermon one time, what, uh, how were they saved by water? That makes sense. Water would have killed them if they were not in the ark. I thought the ark saved them, right? But Peter makes the connection to emphasize baptism because the water washed away the sin. And we need to be in the ark, in the protection of Christ, the church. And that is very, very important. And we do so in baptism. We come to the church that way. So we have the life of Abraham. The life of Abraham. God called him to make a covenant with him and his descendants. And I tell you what, this became their hope. This became their identity. And the more we learn and appreciate Abraham and all that God worked through him and the tests of faith that he had, the more we will appreciate God for working through the, the millennia in order to bring about Christ so that I can be a child of Abraham by faith. If I say that I'm a child of Abraham, that may not mean much unless I know about Abraham. And Genesis tells us about him. God is clear how he feels about sin. And whew, I'm looking at number three and four there. And the behaviors that some people just take for granted and don't think nothing of. Well, uh, this is wasn't scanned for your printing, but I wanted to type it on the screen for your handwriting. Even Abraham himself acted shamefully against his wife Sarah before King Abimelech. That is something else to see that the Bible is so honest about its heroes. They're just human beings. And against that backdrop of sin and fault and failure, we see the glory of God. And that's one thing I love so much about that. And that's not even talking about Lot and the uh, situation with his, his daughters. Um, I'll tell you what. Well, Number five, page two, after more like half a century of waiting for God to fulfill the promise through Isaac, he was born. Abraham, I mean, half a century to wait. Wow, God, God's uh, testing of him, developing him. Abraham's faith was severely tested when, after all that time, he said, offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And this becomes a compare-contrast foreshadowing of Christ. 
God stopped Abraham from offering his only son as a sacrifice, but he did not hold himself back from offering his own son as a sacrifice. Then we see how Isaac and Rebekah, and then they had Esau and Jacob, but Jacob, the younger, got the birthright. Um, God honored that. It's amazing, even though uh, certain things don't happen right, God still will be faithful to his word, regardless of consequence. The life of Jacob. Jacob deceived his father and stole his brother's blessing. We mentioned this, point two. While in exile, Jacob married Leah and Rachel and began a large family that emerged into the nation of Israel. Twelve sons, twelve tribes, you know the story and the name changing. Uh, we also have the life of Joseph. I love to study Joseph about providence and about protection and God's sovereignty. He's always there with you no matter what you go through. And even though the story ends very well, uh, I also think that what matters is staying faithful to God, no matter what. Joseph was sold into slavery, but he became second in command of all of Egypt. And Genesis chapter 45 is very emotional and powerful as you read. Genesis 45, actually a few verses before, all the way um, up to, well, the rest of that chapter, Genesis 45. It is incredible to me how he was hearing in dialogue the, um, the discussion about Benjamin and then how his brothers would react to this, but... He was talking about himself, and some buried emotion deep down came out, and he pushed everyone away. He told everyone to leave him, I should say, and he just wept so much, and then he revealed himself to his brothers who wouldn't have recognized him otherwise, and uh, it was just a beautiful sight to see. But in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph himself says, you intended what you did for my harm, but God turned it for good. And there's a lot of things not good in this world, but if we're faithful, that's the pr promise of the revelation itself. It will be okay. God's going to make it all right, for sure, certainly in that ultimate day. So as you read through Genesis, you'll see some key themes here. Let's go through quickly for the purposes of uh, what I want to conclude with. When you think it's done, it's not quite done. I have a treat for you. <laughs> Creation itself declares the glory, power, majesty, and wisdom of God. The glory and majesty of God. We've talked about that. The uniqueness of human beings, you know, on the same day, which, by the way, the sixth day, God created man and animals. And so how old is the earth? Five days older than humankind on the earth. Genesis 1-1 summarizes everything, and then the rest of it kind of focuses on primarily man and man's world and everything that matters to us. And I find that very interesting. So mankind, different from the animals, and that's so obvious. The biblical view is uh, well, I mean, it's obvious, but the biblical view makes all the difference in how we live. Only humankind was made in the image of God. That's a huge distinction. Huge. Only mankind. We have, it's been said that it's a physical design with a spiritual imprint of his mind. And that's a good way to say it, his impression upon clay. We are matter. So God's view and way of thinking and behaving is upon us. And that's why it says God gave life to all creatures, but only to man did he, humankind, did he give an eternal soul. And our nature can relate to God. And that's what he wants more than anything is that relationship to be with him. Letter C, because humans are made in the image of God... Each human being has and had dignity and great value. They are in, of intrinsic worth. You are of intrinsic worth. Priceless. <sighs> you were bought by a cross, by God on that cross. And a lot of people don't share that worldview. And what are the effects of people who don't care about the life of other people, who don't see themselves as what they are, as portrayed by the Bible? Well, you have people mistreating so many other people, degrading in every way that's not good. The beginning of marriage in the home, this relates, of course. Companionship is pictured early on throughout Scripture as a primary human need. And, of course, marriage is the focus perhaps here, but when God says it's not good for man to be alone, that's a broader sense as well. There are a lot of people who fill our lives with a, ver with a var variety of relationships, some fewer and for special roles, of course, such as my wife, for that role. But... Um, God here chose to meet Adam's need for companionship by creating Adam's opposite and therefore his complement as a spouse. And then, of course, populate the earth. We could talk a lot about that, obviously. But uh, we're studying the things that the world doesn't want you to know. Sin entered the world, we know that, and the fall of humankind occurred, and Genesis 3 begins to tell that story. Already in chapter 3, 
Jesus, God gets to what he wants to tell us. Um, sin is a rejection of God's will. Number three, sin degraded mankind and disrupted his relationships with other human beings. I mean, when sin entered the world, we, we got off track and lost it all. I'm trying to get back ever since. My relationship with you is affected by sin. Yours, mine, and ours. All right? But we're over in Christ overcoming that so we can have the blessings that were originally intended. His uh, universe with nature, mankind's uh, relationship with ourselves. With ourselves. Wow. Do we really know what Adam and Eve had before the fall? I think that we will when we go back to heaven. But number four, from the moment of the fall, the mortal effects of sin are seen. Fundamentally, sin is a heart issue. It's a pride issue. If I have a pure heart, my focus is fully on Christ. No mixed motives. But if I'm contaminated with sin in my life, it's mixed motives. I want my will. But God has His will, and sometimes they don't mesh. They don't match. They don't coalesce. So what do you do in those moments? You have to decide in your heart right now whose will you follow and want to please God. Human beings have tried to sidestep their sin, and they try to uh, do all kind, kinds of things to cover it up or to rename it, but they, will, uh, they can't get away from the consequences of sin. But only is there deliverance when you confess your sin. But well, that is to say, say the same thing about it that God does. Own up to it. The whole Bible is to say, here's your condition, and I want you saved. Being uh, the beginning of salvation... Man's sin never changed the fact that God loves us. There's a key word, loves us. However, the punishment of sin is just, and that is death. Death, separation from a holy God is the only thing that He can do, and God will honor your choice because He's done so much to save us. Beginning with Abraham, and here's the next line that was cut off in copy. Beginning with Abraham, God selected a nation of people through whom... Salvation is offered to the world, to the whole world, through a people through whom salvation would be offered. God wanted Israel to be the first. Some, one preacher said missionary, and I like the word ambassador. <laughs> it wasn't that God says, I'm going to choose you and only you. Don't tell anybody. They were to represent God all that time. They didn't do a very good job of it. But let's make sure we do what they did not. It was through Israel that the Savior was to come. God sent His only Son to do what Israel alone could not. Number seven on the back of the sheet already. God wants to renew and restore us in His own image. We were uh, damaged by the fall. And God wants to restore us, renew us. Number eight. God wants us to be Bearers of the gracious invitation of God to be His royal ambassador of salvation through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I like this adaptation of a very famous work which you know. I'm going to read briefly, very briefly, some things from Rusty Hill's work. And I will save this for the Sunday morning that we uh, promote the book this comes from. Uh, we've had great responses from, from everything here that we've used over the past few years of his work. Uh, I'm looking at more to read than I can. But here's what I'm going to do. One, two, three. The Old Testament teaches us about salvation. The atoning sacrifice of Christ would not come until later. But we see, first of all, the need for salvation. We also find in the Old Testament the constant willingness and the desire of God to save His people. Without that desire and His extraordinary efforts, we would have no hope, no hope of being saved. The story of the Old Testament is our story, told through the eyes and experiences of those who have gone before us. Their victories, their failures, struggles, successes are all recorded as a shadow of our own journey through this world toward eternity. In other words, we can relate. So as you read their stories, do not think that your life is so far removed from theirs that there is no benefit to be found in them. And reading, reading is something we certainly will be doing. Next up, don't think it's over till it's over. Next up, Exodus chapter, well, one through all of the whole book. Uh, lesson three, we're going to focus on Exodus, but to be... 
appreciative of all that's taking place at that time, I encourage you, if you have not yet, read Genesis and those key chapters getting us up to the point. And then the major assignment is the whole book. The minor assignment is chapters 1 through 5, 12, 20, 35, and 40. All right? But after taking a brief mental note of that, my minute hand is right where it should be. Let's see if we can do this. Here's a bonus Devo for you. You can't see this on the screen as well, but maybe on the computer. In fact, not being able to see it is kind of the point. Between those two yellow, uh, white tick marks is what's called the pale blue dot. And you know it well, that's where you're living right now. This photo was taken above by Voyager 1 in 1990, 1990, as it sailed away from Earth more than 4 billion miles in the distance. Having completed its primary mission, details, they asked it to send us a picture back. It actually did. And Earth was captured as an infinitesimal point of light between two white tick marks here. Uh, that's incredible. Many are moved when realizing this tiny dot is our home. As vast as the universe is, God takes that much interest and care about us, and, and how we're created in His image makes us care more about things than maybe in perspective they are, but it's because of how we are and the nature of things eternal that makes us want to be in God's good standing. So what we are going to do tonight is for a four and a half minute video, almost five, I'm going to uh, click play on a video that uh, you have seen before, perhaps, if you go online, but there is something to say. My, let me look here, yeah, the red doesn't show up on my screen because it went off. I think we're using it a lot tonight. The Earth is a very small stage in the vast cosmic arena. Dr. Sagan says, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Uh, scientifically, we're in a very good spot. That's another story. This little planet is ours, a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It is up to us. Well, I think I know what he means from the perspectives he wants us to begin operating from, but from our Christian perspective, from the biblical perspective, I would have to then say, that's not quite right. Help did come from the one who created all things, including life on that pale blue dot. Here's a video that I muted for the sake of your benefit. It's prudent to do so, so that I can then take the script of the video. Yeah, perfect timing. And help you enjoy a journey through the universe and ending with the impression that we started with. It's silent for the first few moments, but I want you to imagine seeing this for the first time. And as I'll read. Ever since man first looked into the night sky, he knew that he was part of something much bigger than himself. The vastness of the heavens was incomprehensible. The breath of it all spoke of things eternal. And in looking at the heavens, man believed that perhaps he was looking into the very face of God, quote unquote. Psalm 19, 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. So where are we in this place called the universe? Our moon is our nearest neighbor, one-fourth of a million miles away. Our sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. Our solar system is flying through space at 134 miles a second, spinning as it goes. It is part of a vast collection of stars and star systems. Scientists estimate that as many as 200 billion stars are part of this collection called the Milky Way galaxy. Saturn, one of our eight planets in our solar system. 
is over one billion miles away, more than a thousand times the size of Earth. Over 200 billion stars in our galaxy, six billion have planetary systems like ours. Every star we can see in the night sky lies in the realm of our own galaxy. Voyager 1 is now the most distant human-made object in space. It was launched in 1977, traveling at a speed of 40,000 miles per hour. It is just now, at the time, arriving at the edge of our solar system. The sun there is only one five-thousandth as bright as it is on Earth, so it is extremely cold and there is little solar energy to provide power. The fact it was still sending data was a remarkable surprise to the scientific community. Our entire solar system, containing the sun and planets, orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy on just one of its outer spiraling arms. Our Milky Way galaxy, the home to our solar system, is just one of over 125 billion galaxies that make up the visible universe. Andromeda is the nearest galaxy. It is 10 million, million, million miles away from the Earth, I can imagine. To travel there at the speed of light, it would only take two million years. Andromeda and the Milky Way form a small cluster of galaxies called the Local Group. Beyond the Local Group are even greater clusters of galaxies. Man has no knowledge whatever of what lies beyond this distance. From Hebrews chapter 11, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made from what is visible. Colossians 1.5, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, things heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Things were created by him, and he uh, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. How big is God? The Bible declares that the endless universe is just one of his creations, as incomprehensible as that is for our minds to conceive. What may be even more unimaginable is that in the vastness of of it all, he loves you and goes to the greatest lengths to show that love immeasurably. The Father has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who willingly came to this planet in the flesh to pay sin's price for us, and he continually extends his hand of love to you. I told you that's a great video, and your presence tonight, I believe, has been blessed. Thank you all so much. Next week, Exodus.